Good morning, Bay Church. Why don't you guys stand to your feet? Let's worship God together. darkness falls, it won't prevail, cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph, oh my God will never fail, oh my God will never fail, I'm gonna see a victory.
our hearts and sing this to the Lord. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in You have been so, so kind to me.
fix our eyes on you
such a good, good father. Lord, thank you for these tender moments, God, where we can be in your presence. God, where we can pour ourselves, our whole selves out to you, God, no matter how stained or broken or incapable we feel or, or worthy, God, we can be in your presence, our full self, God, and you are here with open arms. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your love. So God, we come and we pour this gift out to you, Father, and may you take it, may you fill in those pieces through your son, Jesus. God, because only through you, only through your son are we made whole. Thank you, Father, for that. So Father, we take this time again, we wrap it up, Lord, and say your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Your will be done. That is, I love that. What a beautiful time. Thank you for singing so beautifully. My name is Carrie, and this is my good friend, Nisa. And why don't you greet somebody before you're seated? Well, welcome Faith Church and welcome to our online family. We are just so excited to share another weekend with you guys. And for those of you who are here for your very first time, we would love to get to know you and you can do that by clicking on the welcome button that's on your screen if you're watching online. If you're here, you can go after services to our welcome kiosk where someone will greet you and answer any questions that you may have. You can also use our Bay Church app and there you will find our welcome form and you will also find our notes section so that you can follow along with today's message. Yes, so good, so many things, right? We are so glad that you're here and I am excited to give you a holiday update, okay? Did you know Thanksgiving's just a right around the corner? Oh no, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I feel it too. Um, but we will have the opportunity to serve over 200 families this coming Saturday with a Thanksgiving meal. So we are so glad that our youth department is coming alongside and helping us pass out uh, this, the food, and it's going to be a great time. But the next holiday is what? Christmas. Yeah, and it's just around the corner as well. And a couple weeks ago, I talked about our Compassion Bag effort, which is a way for all of us to participate together in serving our community. It's real simple. And, and many, many of you have um, already taken a bag and you've brought them back. We went into the weekend just having about 50 families served. And uh, we are well over that because so many people have been bringing back their bags. But if you're new to the Compassion Bag, this is just our vehicle of uh, way of um, providing things, tangible things to our community. And we're asking that you provide a family game, whatever family game is fun for you. I hear Target has a deal going on, as does Walgreens, just saying. Uh, but then also a $25 gift card for children, being, giving the opportunity for families to purchase what they need for their children. So I invite you to if you haven't got your bag yet, go pick it up. You can, um, if you don't want to do the shopping, we also got you covered there. You can go to the bay.church forward slash compassion, and there's a place, look for the compassion bag, and you can donate there. Or our online audience, there's a compassion button that you're going to see in the chat. And if we all do this, we have over 500 children that we will be serving. Can you imagine the joy on 500 children's faces knowing that the Bay Church um, was there to love on them and to share, share love and share what we have in our abundance? So let's do this, right? So if you need to pick up a bag, we'll be in the lobby after the service. And speaking of holidays, we will also be celebrating um, Thanksgiving Eve here in our Concord campus on Wednesday, November 24th at 7 p.m. So invite your friends, your family, your neighbors so that we can celebrate together. Man, I just learned how to make bread this week in a bread machine. I'm just saying that's going to be on my holiday menu. It's going to be good. Um, but it is the time that we um, are 
you know, it's the holidays, right? It's our time of giving. It's time of gathering. It's a time that we think about, especially going into Thanksgiving, the abundance that we have living in the United States of America and the privilege that it is. And each week at the Bay Church, we give you an opportunity to give back. And um, there's so many ways you can do that. You can give online. You can text to give. Um, we've got some boxes in the back if you're here and you want to drop off your giving. Um, it's so important to be outside of yourself giving and you experience the love of God in a new way when you sacrificially give. So thank you for being that kind of a church. You're making a difference. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you so much. We understand that even, um, even in a time where maybe we have less than we've had before, there's a way that we can give to you. We can honor you with our giving. I'm thankful, Father, to be surrounded by people who have this uh, passion in their life to reach those in need, to make a difference in the community, to spread the gospel. So, Father, use us. As we just sang, we are available to be used by you, and we honor you with our giving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Well, good morning, you wonderful people. Are you doing good so far this weekend? Doesn't it feel like autumn? It's good stuff. Um, before we dive into Bible study, I would be remiss if I didn't bring you kind of a final update. Last week, uh, after a six-year journey, I had my final cancer appointment. They've pronounced me cured onward and forward till Jesus comes. I could have never made it, guys, without the Lord. He is my Savior, forgiver, and healer. I never could have made it without you, beautiful people. When that happened for me, many of you have been on this journey as well. When it happened for me, I ceased in some sense being a pastor, and I just became part of a faith community of Jesus followers. And you guys wrapped me up in prayer, in love, in fun. And we got through it together, and that's how I felt, and I can't thank you enough. Profoundly thankful for the physical family. I have my wife, Carrie, who was just here, and uh, our four children, grandchildren, son and daughter-in-law, and so. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give a big shout-out, truly, to the extraordinarily gifted, skilled medical community of the Bay Area. And we are, I just, I'm so... They are selfless servants, and they have been unbelievably busy in the last 18 months or so with pandemic, etc. and I just give thanks. So that's what's on my heart first. So let's dive into Bible study. We are in a series in the book of Genesis. We're calling it When God Fell in Love, and we are already on weekend number eight out of 40 weekends, and we are dealing with a toxic topic this week, and it is murder. We're calling it bloodshed, Cain and Abel, and we're in Genesis chapter 4. If you're new to the Bible, Genesis is the very first book of the Bible, and then we're in chapter 4. We're looking at the first 16 verses. If you want to follow along with notes, I want you to know we work very hard uh, to make sure you have a lot of good stuff to help your spiritual progress. All you need to do is on your smartphone device, whatever you use, simply go to the Bay Church app. It's a blue background with a blue, white B in it. And you'll see our campuses, tap on Concord Campus, tap on Message Notes, and it's right there for you, okay? So join us that way as well. We're gonna do more than talk about murder uh, today. We're gonna talk about something much more, and that is why murder still seems to live in the human heart. Even this morning when I got up, when I'm reading uh, my Bible and reading kind of current events, just doing a quick online perusal, uh, I just said, okay, those three people were murdered. Yeah, those 79 were murdered. Those 18 were murdered. As I'm just looking at global events, we seem to be some 8 billion people with our hands at each other's throats. You say, John, where did this begin? It's our Bible study today as we talk about it from Genesis 4. So let me read it to us. You follow along Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 14, okay? 
Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became, she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. So the first human being born in the natural way of things in marital love is Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, so he's a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer. He worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Remember that word, firstborn. So the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Now, I will hit the pause button and tell you that's a complex, almost unknowable why he favored one and not the other, but we'll get to that momentarily. Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. The Lord said to Cain, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, Cain. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse. You are driven from the ground, which opens its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. In fact, uh, nobody killed Cain and also God didn't kill Cain. Actually, God reached for him with an olive branch of mercy, gave him mercy, gave him grace. Uh, Cain left the garden, left God's presence, and actually started a city, and we'll get to that in weekends ahead. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, do you remember what happened in the magnificence of that first creative week? God brought order from chaos. That's chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. But in chapters 3 through 11, where we are right now in chapter 4, you see that we're going backwards into chaos. Once again, you're saying, John, what has taken us backwards into chaos again? Well, it's sin that's crouching at our door, desiring to have us. First of all, Cain and Abel's mother and father, you may remember, disobeyed the Lord. And that brought about what we would call commonly theologically the fall of mankind or of humankind. And you can see that their children, their sons, are following in their sinful footsteps. And so in some way, mankind's rebellion has undone the magnificence of God's mastery and creative order. So what you have here, if you really think about it with me, everybody, we have the firstborn child on the planet meaning Cain, meaning he's the first one that came from the marital love of his parents. Remember, Adam and Eve were created. They were not birthed. God created Adam and Eve in his image. And Cain is born from these created parents, and he murders his very own brother. So the first two siblings on the planet, one kills the other. How many of y'all got siblings and this desire has come upon you, especially if you had to share a bedroom and bunk beds and all the other things, right? You say, well, John, this story isn't really uh, about me. It's about two guys a long time ago, Cain and Abel. No, not really. Uh, it's actually about the downward trajectory of the whole human family. It's about all of us. If you don't believe me, let me just tell you what's going on. Fact. Every year in the United States of America, 22% of all murders, so in our whole land, every year of all the murders, 22% are committed by family members against family members. There's a lot of hate in the human heart. Let's bring it closer to home and talk about the Bay Area. This is not a comprehensive exhaustive. We just got it offline 
uh, for the Contra Costa County. In Pittsburgh, in 2020, now not 21, just 2020, the last full year for which there are totals, in Pittsburgh, there were five murders, Antioch, 10 murders, Richmond, 17 murders, Concord, three murders, Brentwood, one murder, Rodeo, one murder, El Sobrante, two, San Pablo, two, and Danville, two. If you went to Alameda County, two murders in Dublin, six in San Leandro, 11 in Hayward, five in Berkeley, two in Fremont, two in Alameda, one in Pleasanton, and two in Castro Valley. San Mateo County, five murders in Palo Alto, one in Brisbane, four in San Mateo, one in Colma, one in San Bruno, and one in Redwood City. Uh, speaking of city, the city itself, San Francisco, there were 43 murders in the year 2020. In San Jose, there were 44 murders in 2020. And in Oakland in 2020, there were 96 murders. Now, the sad news is Oakland so far in 2021, just as of this week, as of November 10th, there's already been 119 murders in Oakland this year. So there's nothing more relevant to the human species, to the human family, than this issue of hate that grows in the human heart and becomes murder. And so we're gonna kind of do a diagnosis and an analysis, not just what happens. We know what happened. One brother kills his other brother. But why did it happen? Because this hate which leads to murder is evidently as strong or stronger today than it's ever been in human history. Because while that was the first murder that we're reading about in Genesis 4, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of murders have followed since throughout history. How many murders do you and I see every year in media, movies, marketing? And you say, yeah, John, but it's just actors on a stage, actors and actresses. And so, yeah, it is. But we're able to watch it and barely flinch when we see cold-blooded murder. We've become desensitized because we see it so frequently. I haven't even mentioned that every day in the United States, several thousand American lives are taken through abortion. So when we look at what's happening in our world today, this Cain and Abel thing is highly relevant to our lives. And we need to understand why we humans get to the place that we hate each other so bad that we want to kill each other in the first place. Okay, let's dive in. Verse number one, join me there, would you please? The first husband and wife, Adam and Eve, make love. They are with child. They call him Cain. Verse 2, along comes a second son. His name is Abel. Now, the boys have different vocations. One serves the animals. He's a shepherd. That's Abel. And one serves the soil. He's a farmer. That's Cain. Now, in verses 3 through 5, the plot really begins to thicken. Because the boys each bring an offering to God, and it's relative to their daily labor. So one's a farmer, one's a shepherd. They're bringing some of the produce, some of the fruits of their labor as an as a offering to God to say thank you and to, to honor the Lord. The intrigue arises when God looks with favor on one offering, Abel's, and not the other offering, Cain's. Another factor that makes it really complex, everybody, is that in ancient cultures, uh, not in every culture, but in most, the firstborn child and especially the firstborn son uh, got a double portion of the inheritance and had a favored stature and a favored place in the family pecking order. And here's the thing. God is favoring the offering of the younger brother, not the older brother. That's enough to give any older brother indigestion, right? When you're little pesky kid brother. And uh, we see this kind of thing again and again. When God seems to favor one individual over another, and we'll get to this in just a moment, but I want to say, rather than ask why God shows favoritism to others and not to me or to you, ask first, what is in my heart? What is my true motivation? What is my true intent? Am I purely motivated? 
But even when God does favor one over the other, always remember, it's not at the expense of the other. It is usually for the sake of the others. Think of Joseph with me. If you're familiar with the Genesis narrative of Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis, last 15 chapters, we're going to get into it. It is scintillating. It's awesome stuff. Joseph's one of 12 brothers. The father, not God the father, his earthly father, liked him better than his 11 brothers. And his 11 brothers said, okay, we're going to put you in a pit. And this jealousy, which led to their multiple attempts at murder, fulminated that when Joseph is at the height of his manhood, he is now a global, in, in the world of antiquity, he's now a global leader. And so God showed him favor so that he could be used as a blessing to all people. So it wasn't about God so much rejecting others as it is God using a chosen instrument like a Joseph uh, for his purposes that ultimately only he knows. Now, brothers at war, siblings at conflict is nothing new. You've had it maybe in your life. In the Bible, we have here Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael. We have Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. I just alluded to that. In Israel's history, we have the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. You say, John, offer me some balanced reflections here. Give me some perspective. Give me some context. Okay, let me offer a few things. I say it again, and you and I will be on safe ground if we operate with this assumption that only God can ultimately know our hearts. Only God can ultimately know the human heart, our true intent, our true motivation, the true why for what we did, what we did. We say one thing, but what was really in our heart? Are we in some sense not all actors and actresses on a stage and yet maybe there's something just below the surface of the skin happening in our heart, our spirit, our soul. So don't drive yourselves crazy with the unanswerables, the unknowables, why God favored one offering and not the other. Secondly, there is a subtle clue as to why this might have happened in terms of the intent of the boy's offerings. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me again. You'll notice that Cain brought, the Bible says, some of the fruits of the soil. It just seems like almost an afterthought, a real casual, oh yeah, I better grab some of these things here. That is not how Abel approached it. Remember I said, note the word firstborn? The Bible says Abel brought portions of the firstborn of his flock. In other words, the new little lambs that were being born, he gave those first ones to the Lord. So Abel was, it seems more earnest, more purely motivated to make sure that his offering was an offering that would honor the Lord. Because when you give the firstborn, you are giving not only the first, you are giving your very best. And it's interesting to note in the uh, record of God's people in the Old Testament, the Hebrews, one of the things God says repeatedly to these shepherds, for example, when you give me an offering, don't just thin out your flocks. Don't just call out the weak DNA strain. I don't want your one-eyed sheep and your three-legged cows. See, because that's what we do. Well, I'm going to give an offering, and it's going to cost me something. This one-eyed sheep and this three-legged cow is not worth very much. I can't breed them, and et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes we give God leftovers. Sometimes we give God that which will least affect our financial bottom line, and we're not giving him the first and the best. And that, to me is the essential clue of what I'm sharing with you at this point. But again, we don't ultimately know other than that God knows our hearts, and that seems to be the one clue about the intent of the boy's offerings. Here's the third reflection I can offer you, and it's this. Cain still had a choice. The boys have brought their offerings to God. In some way, we're not sure. The favor of God is made evident upon Abel's offering, not so upon Cain's offering. And now Cain is faced with a choice, revenge or forgiveness or, Father, help me understand, creator God, why my offering might not have been pleasing to you. And then the father the creator tells Cain why it is so. But that's not where Cain goes. He goes immediately 
with his very angry countenance to the place of rage and hatred that would only be satiated with revenge and ultimately murder. So he had a choice. Go down to verses 4 through 7 with me, would you please? The Bible says Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. I can imagine him with clenched fists. His face is down. He's muttering epitaphs to himself. He's thinking about how much he despises that little brother. And this is what happens in verse number seven. If you're going to really chew on something, meditate on something from our Bible study this weekend at the Bay Church, focus on verse seven of Genesis four. Verse seven says it all. Do what is right, Cain, and you will be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Put that in a place where you can easily see it this week and really think about its implications in my life. Father, what does this mean for me? Are my motivations right? Is my outward behavior and my internal intent, are those aligned? Are they the same thing? I have a thing I teach young men and women entering ministry, and it's this. May what we appear to be in a public setting like this and what we really are in private places and secret times, may those be the same thing. Because then you don't have to have a good memory. You have a clean conscience. You sleep well at night. You never have broken intimacy with the Father if you live that kind of life. But here we have Cain, very angry, seducing or sort of tricking or entrapping his brother, inviting him out to the field, probably so they were away from the eyes of mother and father, Adam and Eve, but never away from the eyes of God, and one kills the other. You could say in Cain killing Abel, it's like mother like son, because this first child in the whole of creation uh, sins similarly to her to his mother and father Adam and Eve. Uh, Cain fails to resist the creature crouching at the door of his life, but there's still a difference. Eve and Adam, uh, when they did what they did in disobeying God, they only took some fruit that was not theirs and ate of it. What Cain has done is killed a human being that was created in the image of God. In other words, sin has taken a big leap forward between generations, mother, father, and now these brothers, these children, these sons. You say, John, what can I do when the circumstances of my life seem unfair, undeserved, unjust, not right, etc.? This is the only thing I can tell you, and it's what I have had to do at the great disappointment moments in my life. You can't control circumstances. What we can control with God's enabling grace is how we choose to respond. So rather than rage about what cannot be changed in the moment, we say, I will trust God. I will focus on growing a good heart. Those things I can do, and I leave the outcomes to God, and I will learn to live in certain aspects of my life without ultimately knowing why. Let me tell you what I mean. Any of y'all got kids? We all intend to be really good, always patient, purely motivated parents, but when you got four little kids running around, raising mayhem, tearing the house down, and being children, right, at some point, you default to the oldest of all rationale for obedience. Okay, after you've done this 117 times, the same thing, and the kid says, why? You say, okay, let me make this simple. Because I said so. Well, that's just our kind of default setting. Because I said so. Now, the kid doesn't have the mental capacity to say, okay, I'm going to trust the pure motivation of my father or mother who just told me because I said so. That illustration, if you pick it up, is similar here. There's many things in today's passage. We can speculate, but we can't ultimately know why. But God knows why, and we know that the character of the Lord, as Scripture indicates, that he is just, 
true, holy, and loving. So we operate under the assumption that the motivations of his decisions are right, and we can learn to live without knowing why. And then this. I've also found that God won't change our circumstances till we change our attitude. One of the things we have to ask if we're going to be real, we've got to say, listen, these cascading circumstances uh, that have happened in my life, I'm in, I'm in my fourth relationship that I thought was heading to the marriage altar. I'm in my ninth job. I'm in my, you know, you fill in the blanks. And the same outcome seems to be happening again and again and again. Everybody else in the world cannot possibly be a blithering idiot except me. Maybe I am doing things that are precipitating this cascade of very painful circumstance in my life. Search me, O God, and know me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. God, search my heart. I will trust you. I will grow a good heart. And God, I will have an internal attitude adjustment. And God, I know that when I make good decisions, you follow me with good blessing. Righteous decisions invite righteous blessing and righteous consequence and wrong decisions, unhealthy decisions, unbiblical decisions often bring pain. Make that determination in your life as we work through these verses. Look at 8 through 14. So in verses 8 through 14, which we've read already, you know that Cain chooses horribly. He murders his brother in premeditated cold blood. This has happened hundreds of millions of times since on the planet with all the wars and all the murders and all the evil regimes and empires that have come and gone and all the hate-filled family members that have taken out their wrath on the blood of their very own family. There's three other insights I want to offer at this juncture. You'll want to make note of these. You'll want to remember these. The first is this, Abel's blood was innocent human blood. You say, John, what do you mean? What I mean is each human being is of inestimable value in the sight of God created in his image. We cannot snuff out another life without thinking there will be consequence in this life and in the next. And I'm not just talking about the American judicial system or any judicial system. I am talking about in the fabric of God's very created universe, it is a moral universe where we are clearly informed that there is a right and there is a wrong. And one of the wrongest of all wrongs is to shed innocent human blood. It brings consequence. The Bible says, God remembers. If you look at verse 10, I recite the verses. God's first comments to Cain after he exposes what he's done. He says, Cain, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. My son Cain, what have you done and why have you done this? Now we're in chapter 4 of Genesis. If you went five chapters to the right, to chapter 9 in verse 5, this is what you discover God saying in that context. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting for the life of each human being, for in the image of God has God made humankind. Secondly, the second insight is that we, in fact, are our brother's keeper. Did you notice Cain's flippant, angry, defensive response? Why are you asking me? Am I now my brother's keeper? Here's the answer. Yes, we are. And so the next question is, who is my brother and who is my sister? There's no indecision about the conclusion of all of Scripture, Old Testament and New, that every other human being is our brother and sister. And all we have done, uh, and again, highlighted in the last year, year and a half, is judge one another, exclude one another, discriminate against one another because of all kinds of differences which cannot be helped, which in fact in the sight of God are beautiful. 
and created in his image. And we humans, we like to build walls instead of bridges and we excel at judging and we excel at pride controlling our heart and we are not treating the rest of humanity like our brothers and sisters and violence breaks God's heart. He says, you are your brother's keeper. What God is saying to us today as human beings is that he wants us to take care of each other. He wants us to take care of each other. He wants us to take care of each other. That's what the Father wants. He wants us to take care of one another. We're all human beings together created in his image. We've all got challenges in our life. We all have gifts from God and beautiful things and wonder. Let's help one another. Let's serve one another. Let's care for one another. The third insight that I glean is consequences. Do you notice what happens in Cain's heart? Because it comes out his mouth. He moans in verse 13 after God tells him what's going to happen as consequence for his murder. He says, my punishment is more than I can bear. What is Cain experiencing in that moment when he kills Abel? I think two things at least. First of all, kind of a enraged exultation that he has slain the beast. He has killed that which has stolen the favor of God, probably the favor of their parents, Adam and Eve, and seemed to have a favored path in life. He has removed Abel from the planet. So there's this sort of wicked gratification. But immediately on its heels, he is racked. Racked by guilt and shame and terror and self-loathing and ultimately separation from God. And that's why he cries out in verse 13, my punishment is more than I can bear. I'd be remiss as your pastor if I didn't suggest to you that God has not mocked whatever we sow, that will we also reap. That in life there is Mr. Kick and Mr. Kickback. I, I have no delight in sharing that, but I must in love and humility speak truth. You say, but John, I'm a free person to make my choices. Yes, we are free moral agents. We do have free will to choose, and we can make choices that define our lives. But always remember this, just like Cain, while we can make the choices, we cannot choose the consequences. Those are built into the choice. Does that make sense? Teach that to your sons and daughters. You say, well, John, all I want is good consequences in my life. Me too. Let's make good choices that align with Holy Scripture and invite the blessing and the favor of God upon our lives. Listen to John Golden Gay, a, a fellow human being and a believer, confessing his own sin. He says, I was once describing to my counselor how I came to do something very wrong in my life, and I said, quote, I knew this thing was going to happen, so I just let it happen. That's just how it seemed at the time. Sometimes we can't understand our own actions. I wonder whether I meant that at some unconscious level, I'd already decided I was going to do it. For we do things in an ideal world we don't want to do, and we fail to do the things that really deepen our heart of hearts we know that we should do. It's as if sin is quite literally crouching at our doors, and we have the desire to do well, but seemingly we do not have the willpower to do well. If we're honest with ourselves, that thing was already a thing internally before we behaved it and acted it out. You know, when David sent the army out in the springtime of the year, at the time when kings usually lead their armies, he'd already been plotting a convenient moment to seduce Bathsheba. You may remember that story. And it's when we're not honest with ourselves and honest to God that we almost create this deluded fantasy world and we can almost get ensnared in it. Let's wrap up with three big so what's. In other words, three things of how we can apply this weekend's teaching to our lives this day in the bay. Number one, in this story, there's hope for all parents. You say, John, what do you mean hope for all parents? To me, it looks like misery for all parents. No, not so. Because remember that even the first two people, Adam and Eve, 
in a perfect, sin-free world and having the perfect parent, God, even Adam, Adam and Eve rebelled. And even God lost his first two children. So as free moral agents, in a sense, it is true what God says to Cain, that sin is crouching at our door, desiring to have us. Here's the point. Raising kids is a highly complicated um, task of imperfections and warts and potholes and all kinds of challenge. It's painful to see faults and sins from our lives visit our children. Remember what the Bible says, the sins of the fathers and mothers will visit upon the third and fourth generation. You say, John, what can I do to stop this thing and my family in its tracks? Here's what you can do. Begin today, literally today, to build a spiritual and moral framework in your child's life. A biblical balance of love and discipline. And the later you started, the more challenging it will be. But what good parents do, they show up and they get to work building a healthy, righteous foundation for their children's lives. Number two, the real reason that we have murder in our heart, and here's the juice. Here's the key moment of our whole Bible study. In Matthew chapter five, Jesus teaches us that every outward behavior has an unchecked, growing internal attitude attached to it. So he said, guys, if you look upon a woman with sexual lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. He's not saying you've actually, as a fact, physically committed the act of adultery, but he said it has grown to a fixed place of conclusion internally. You say you will never do this, but you know what's happening in your heart, and the actual act of adultery is not far behind because you've seduced her already in your imagination, in your spirit. And that's a hard thing in our culture today with the kind of promiscuity we have. He continues that very passage, and he says, similarly, if you have anger toward another, you have already committed murder in your heart. What Jesus is getting to is tend the seed. Remove the seed of lust or of anger or of anything else because if we don't, they will grow and ultimately become adultery or murder. I think it could be like this. Check out this sequence. We have the offense in our lives, somebody offends us, somebody hurts us badly. I know that when we come to the holidays like this, not all of us are looking forward to Thanksgiving and Christmas and everybody coming to town. It makes me think of Chevy Chase and National Lampoons and Cousin Eddie and all that shenanigan. The offense happens, we're sinned against. And then we make a choice and this choice is that which sets up everything it is that is to follow. Is our choice going to be to forgive or to not forgive? If we choose unforgiveness, what will grow in our heart is bitterness over the weeks, months, years, decades. What will come from bitterness is full-on anger and rage. And what will grow from anger and rage, in fact, is hatred accompanied by its evil bedfellows of envy and jealousy and the lust for revenge. Once the house is set internally in its toxic entirety, at some point, the actual act of murder will emerge. That's what Jesus seems to be saying. And so the key step is to change our lives by learning to forgive. I don't know any other way that we can overcome unless at this all-important, pivotal moment we release our offense, our bitterness toward that other person. If we do not, those things will be ever crouching at our door. Jesus commands us further in the New Testament that those who are forgiven must ourselves forgive other people because if we do not forgive we will not be forgiven he explicitly says that that God's forgiveness of us is directly attached in proportion to our willingness to forgive other human beings 
who sin against us, who offend us, who do us wrong. It's this way. Forgiveness sets the captive free, only to realize the prisoner was me. And ultimately, forgiveness is me giving up the desire to hurt you for hurting me. You say, John, this can't be done. You're right. In our own ability, it cannot be done. But with God, all things are possible. God will give us grace to release the anger, the hostility, the bitterness, the offense, the rage, the hatred. God will help us, but we got to want to. We have to decide and take an active step in that direction. And I wrap with number three. You and I still have a choice. If you and I have made bad decisions in life, the first thing we have to do is not deny we got to own it. I did this thing. What's the first thing God asked Cain? What have you done? And Cain never confessed. He just deflected. He just flippantly, sarcastically, am I my brother's keeper? If we've made bad decisions, we need to own it. And then secondly, know that we still have another choice. And that other choice is to come to God and say, Father God, would you forgive me of my sins? And then we need to start making right decisions because there's not a person in this room. You are not doomed. You are not condemned. You are not beyond hope. And you most certainly are not beyond God's love. Not a person in this house. Remember also the scripture says where sin abounds, grace abounds so much more. It's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance It should be our kindness and our ability to extend forgiveness that rights severed relationship. Really, truly strong people can go go first to initiate reconciliation. Final thought, integrity. God says, grow an integrous heart and you won't have to worry about any of this. If we live with integrity, nothing else matters. And if we do not live with integrity... Nothing else matters. And everyone said, stand to your feet, dear friends, would you please? We're going to wrap with a brief song of worship, and we had a beautiful time of of healing prayer up front. We're going to open up the up front area to pray for you. And in your coming, it's not saying... I'm a sinful cat. I'm just a really bad person. Not at all. It's saying, you know what? I'm going to respond to Scripture because I realize there's some things in my heart. They're killing me. They're toxic. Uh, They're affecting not just the person I'm angry toward or the situation. It's affecting every other relationship. I am not a peach to live with. I'm not a pleasant person to live with. I'm I'm a bummer. And I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm going to bring it to God. I'm going to ask his forgiveness, and then I'm going to start making right decisions, and God will give me grace to do so, and his favor will follow me. And so it's a moment of beginning again, a moment of healing. So you begin to come. Warnell and Lindsay will lead us in a song of worship. You come and find a place of prayer, and then I'll wrap us in prayer, okay? Go ahead. So Holy Spirit, you Oh, welcome here. Come fly this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our heart longs for. To be overcome by your presence alone. Just continue to come, friends. You're among friends. We're family. We care for one another and we help one another. You come.
Father, we do come and pray as family, and there's no perfect person in the house. We're all growing, we're learning. God, we are making some mistakes. We're, we're making some bad judgment calls. Maybe we're acting rashly or out of some really bad instincts and impulses. But God, this is a healing moment of grace. Never do we see you turn away truly sorry individuals or repentant individuals or men or women who have hope in their hearts to be given a second chance, who freely come and confess and say, I have done this thing. Father God, not only forgive me, but let me go forward now doing the right thing. I own it, I am responsible. Grow in me a righteous heart, a good heart, not a Cain heart. God, I utterly reject that I will become a hate-filled person a person of revenge and bitterness and violence in my heart, but that I will grow a good heart of joy and love, of peace, of all the good things of God. Lord, would you reach into the hearts, the minds, the lives, and the relationships of the beautiful men and women that have come forward now, and would you wash them clean with your amazing grace? Restore not only them, but every relationship they're involved, let it be miraculous because two people have been very angry with one another, afraid of one another, avoiding one another. God, I pray that you bring people together and homes together and relationships together. For you oppose the proud, but you give much grace to the humble. Give us grace this day, God. Restore these beautiful men and women. Restore relationships. Restore parents and their children. God, I pray that you let mothers and fathers particularly determine I will build in the life of my son and daughter a foundation for all that is good and right and true. I will not wring my hands in passive despair, but I will say it is my entrustment to invest that which is right and good in the lives of my daughter and of my son, and this I will do. Thank you for these beautiful people, Father. Set all of us free. Whomever the sun sets free is really free. Grow in us the kind of heart that deeply honors you. We love you so much in Jesus' name. And everyone said, those of you at the altar look at me here for just a minute. You may have came, come to the altar in angst or anguish or guilt or shame even, despair. Now, let the peace of God and the grace of God and the hope of Christ Jesus our Lord, let it wash you clean and make you whole. When you walk out of this house and maybe shame hits you again and you say, God, remember that thing I did? He'll say, what thing? You know that thing, what thing? In other words, in, in some sense, he flushes it and it's washed away. But now let's go forward and doing the right thing and building a life that is built upon the right thing that invites the favor of God to come after us. 
I love you all so much. Have a great rest of the day, and I'll look forward to seeing you next weekend, okay?